welcome everybody and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And uh, so uh, this, today we have uh, another great seminar speaker, Anna Yasen from CMU, uh, to share with us uh, a very exciting paper, the editor and the algorithm, value of data and the externalities in online news. So we will be speak, uh, using the first 40 minutes for the presentation. If you have thoughts, suggestions, please feel free to use the chat window to share this. And if you have some clarified questions, please feel free to raise your hand. And we will then use the last 20 minutes for Q&A. So uh, without further ado, uh, uh, Anaya, why don't you go ahead? Uh, thank you, Feng. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you for having me here. This is a uh, joint work with uh, Jörg Klossen, who's at LMU Munich. I think he's joined us uh, on Zoom here as well. Christian Poikert, uh, who's at ETH Zurich and in Catholica Lisboa. And I'm going to talk about the editor and the algorithm. So let me, okay. Yeah, let me start with the big picture. Um, you know, we all know that news plays an important role in a vibrant democracy, provides information, uh, you know, during, especially during the pandemic, we're seeing how potential misinformation, even from mainstream outlets can have drastic consequences. Um, so for credible, uh, for credible news, uh, news outlets to exist, uh, you know, it is super important just as uh, a pillar of democracy. But we also know as, you know, as a digitization crowd, um, as a platform crowd, that digital transformation over the past couple of decades has severely affected uh, the news industry's financial health. And this is, you know, not only in the US, it's across the board, barring a couple of countries. Um, more recently, though, uh, it's been hypothesized that, you know, new technologies, you know, such as artificial intelligence, the use of artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning in particular within the newsroom can potentially shore up firm revenues. You know, the idea is that you have uh, a large amount of data on, uh, on people's preferences. Uh, you can have algorithms which can uh, mine these sort of data sets and identify uh, certain preferences which uh, traditionally human editors might not be able to do. Uh, and I, you know, the, the paper is about human editors and algorithms mainly because human editors are the status quo, especially in mainstream news outlets. So the broad question that we're looking at uh, is whether human editorial decisions can be aided by algorithmic recommendations. And we're going to try and address this question in a simple news curation setting, but it's a large scale field experiment that we run with one of the biggest German uh, news outlets. This issue about human editors and algorithms is, you know, is a debate which has been happening in the news industry for, uh, for a few years now. Uh, for example, Facebook, you know, Facebook as a news curator um, first had human editors, then it fired its team of human editors, then ha it had uh, algorithms choosing trending news, then they abandoned trending news, and now they're, uh, you know, they've they've hired a bunch of humans to curate news stories. Similarly, Apple, you know, this became big news in 2018. Apple hired about 40 uh, mainstream journalists from, uh, you know, from the news industry in, in the US. And they said that, you know, these humans are going to curate the news for, uh, for all, uh, all their users. These are news, you know, uh, these are sort of um, news aggregators in some sense. But mainstream news outlets have been have been really reluctant to uh, to sort of take this approach. Um, it became big news uh, last year, uh, like exactly a year ago, with the New York Times saying that for the first time uh, they are going to allow personalization uh, on their website. So there'll be an algorithm which you know which will take into account what you sort of read before uh, and try and recommend uh, recommend you. And, you know, again, they, they talk about how, you know, the human editorial judgment is, is the most important. Um, so more generally, when we think about human editorial decisions and, and algorithms within the news industry, you know, it's, it's not completely clear um, where one might outperform the other because it's, you know, a, it's curation inherently subjective. 
there's a creative production process. You have to try and understand what is quote unquote important or, you know, or what might get clicks, what might drive up your revenues. And you have to be really quick because timing is critical as you know, in this paper by Julia Cage, who shows that, you know, most news stories online or some of the biggest news stories get copied within uh, the first three to five minutes. Uh, you know, news events are happening all the time. Consumers' preferences might be changing. And hence, it might be the case that, uh, that this is a place where human judgment might have uh, a reasonably big role to play. So we try and dig deep, uh, deeper into this question to, to try and understand how algorithmic performance might be affected relative to human judgment and, and how does different types of data affect this, uh, affect this performance? Because any, any conversation about how algorithms do or how machine learning does in general cannot, you know, cannot be divorced from how much data goes into, uh, into feeding uh, the algorithm. So we're going to look at two dimensions of, um, of data personal versus social. So individual level versus aggregate. So, you know, let's say new strengths versus what you have clicked on and also the stock versus the flow of the data. So uh, do you need to continuously update your, uh, update your model or the fact that a person has clicked on enough to accumulate a stock of pref you know, a stock of data, uh, how do they interact? I framed this in terms of the news industry, but you know this is more broadly related to uh, the debate about you know what the value of data is, what should uh, what should policy look like. You know the Economist saying you know in 2017 is data the new oil. Andrew Yang, who was uh, um, who was a candidate in the Democratic presidential primaries this uh, this year, is is suggesting data dividends where tech companies get back. Uh, get that then you know you pay a bit of the revenues back to uh, the users who create that data there are uh, a couple of studies on the value of data but you know they point to uh, they point to mixed results um, in general you know the, i think there's a consensus growing that data might not you know or certain dimensions of data might not be as important as, as they seem but you know it uh, the debate is still going on um, one of the issues that has come up in, in these sort of papers is uh, sort of summarized by the sentence uh, in this Amazon paper by uh, Pat Byrie and, and co-authors is that the effect that they identify due to uh, access to longer histories of data can also be uh, driven by continuous improvements in forecasting technology. And what, what we will hopefully be able to do in this uh, in this field experiment is actually identify potentially the causal impact uh, of of data histories and finally um, you know to sort of round up uh, the whole topic the flip side of this is that if an algorithm keeps recommend you recommending you stuff to click on how does that impact the user's consumption preference and this is again important because uh, there's this issue about filter bubbles, algorithmic reinforcement, um, especially in uh, you know in polarizing issues. And that's the that's the final question that we ask: How does algorithmic curation affect uh, consumption diversity in this context? So, if I do run out of time, just in case you know, uh, as an overview of the results, um, on average we find that personalization in particular, so not uh, uh, not social recommendations, personalizations increase uh, clicks by 3.7% relative to uh, the human editor, but diminishing returns kick in quite quickly. Can human curation ever perform better? Is there a role for human judgment? We do find uh, certain instances especially when there is limited individual data. So when the recommendations are based on aggregate news trends, we find that the editor is able to identify uh, the average preferences better. Moreover, a human can do better is when there's lack of continuous updating of the algorithm. This is, this is mitigated a little by the existing stock of preferences, 
uh, but we, we find at least in this context that you need to keep updating your algorithm quite a bit. How does personalization affect consumption patterns? We find that treated users uh, do reduce their consumption diversity. So they, uh, they sort of do narrow their consumption. And this is you know, primarily sort of driven because personalization is playing a big role in increased click rates. And we find that this effect gets reinforced over time. Uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll try and show you a picture about how, how things progress if you come on to the website 10 times, 50 times, 100 times. So that's the broad overview of the paper. Uh, if there, I don't know if there are any questions at this stage or I should just uh, dive in to some of the details. Okay, so it seems that we're all good. So the empirical setting is that we partner up with one of the largest German news outlets. This, um, this news outlet gets about uh, 20 million unique visitors a month. That's about 100 million clicks a month. So it's quite a bit. They care about uh, clicks based advertising revenue. Um, so, you know, it's not, you know, editorial judgment would potentially take into account, you know, uh, how interesting or how many clicks an article uh, might get. The homepage of the outlet is uh, curated completely by human editors. All content is produced by humans. Um, and a user who arrives at the homepage sees the same content across the board. So it's not, it's not personalized based on location or anything else. So what the experiment does is that each time a user comes to the landing page, she's randomly assigned to a treatment or a control group. If the user is in the control group, then she's going to see all the articles on the home page as curated by the human editor. So this is the status quo. Um, if if the user is in the uh, is in the uh, treatment condition, then it will see one slot on the home page which is uh, customized based on her reading preferences. And the, the only thing that we could negotiate with this news outlet along with the data science team was slot number four on the page. But uh, remember that you know this is a large news outlet uh, with again over 100 million clicks a month. So slot number four also gives us, you know, a large amount of uh, traffic to deal with to precisely estimate uh, uh, our parameters. Um, the experiment ran for uh, for five months. So it's a reasonably long period of time, which actually relative to other papers allows us to trace out some of the dynamics because often other, you know, uh, often these field experiments last for a week, two weeks, three weeks. Uh, at the most, just to just to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of uh, in terms of the experimental setting. So again, as I said, it's a simple curation exercise. What um, what the what the control condition would be is just the human editor choosing all uh, the articles on on the homepage, and there are on average eighty articles on the homepage at any particular uh, point in time. What, uh, what the algorithm is going to do is that if a user comes on to the website and let's say uh, the user has some prior history, the algorithm identifies uh, what potential article this particular user might want to click on and it might identify, let's say, um, article six. In, in the standard status quo setting, it might, uh, the algorithm might identify that article six is more likely to be clicked on than uh, say article four. And so it's going to bump up article six and push everything down. So the ranking the ordinarily remains the same, but it's just one switch that that happens. So, you know, again, it's a simple setting, all articles written by humans, initial, in some sense, the initial curation is done uh, is done by uh, humans as well, but then we're trying to see whether um, this can be augmented by algorithms and how that uh, varies based on the data that they have. 
I've been talking a lot about the algorithm. Um, Ananya, could I just ask a quick question there? Yes. Which is, um, did it ever happen that the algorithm could put onto the home page an article which would not otherwise have been on the home page at all? Uh, no. So, the, so the algorithm has you know quite a broad choice set at any point in time because you know it's going from one to eighty and we can actually see you know what rank it was pulled up from and it never goes beyond like 81 or 82 which is generally the maximum number of articles okay so yeah i have a question too please uh, in your introduction you uh, made very broad statement about what personalization would do in general but your experiment is on a very specific form of personalization uh, will you try to explain to us why you think you know, what's general and not general in the lessons you are getting? Uh, right, so I think it's, you know, with this, with this type of a question, there are, you know, there are different dimensions of, you know, where uh, general, you know, where it might be generalizable or not. I was getting to one of them, which is, you know, the algorithm used. So it's you know the algorithm that you know and how how the algorithm used in, interacts uh, with the data. I mean I didn't I didn't I mean I, I don't want to walk back you know uh, I can have a general conversation about you know uh, how I see the literature on the value of data and the studies, but uh, I think this is going to be one piece of the puzzle. We're not necessarily saying that this is how let's say Google or Facebook would necessarily uh, you know, value their data, but as of now, we have, you know, we don't have that many estimates. And so this is just trying to take a first step. Uh, and may maybe towards the end, I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, the contribution of the paper and how it fits in with different strands of the literature. And I also link it to the computer science literature. And maybe then we can, we can have a broader conversation. Okay. Thank you. But again, you know, it's uh, as I was saying that you know I've been talking about the algorithm quite a bit, uh, and this is you know one area where there are many different types of algorithms. Uh, the data science team in this particular case um, used um, a highly cited you know uh, an algorithm which was developed by Google engineers. So that was that uh, developed in 2010. That was used as the baseline, and then they put some bells and whistles on it which we are not completely aware of. We know that uh, we know of the 2010 paper. It's been cited uh, heavily and the model is reasonably flexible in that it tries to predict an individual's preference uh, for different content categories. So, but these content categories are extremely fine grained. Um, you know, at, on any given day, there are over 200 uh, content categories that, uh, that the model chooses from. Um, as, as I said before, um, the algorithm works such that it's a, it uses a combination of social data, which is collaborative filtering, and personal data, which is information filtering. This is, you know, uh, computer science uh, uh, recommended system talk. Basically, when there is limited data on an individual, then, uh, then the algorithm is going to overwhelmingly use social data, that is other people's current reading behavior, as the algorithm gets more and more information on that particular individual. Um, personal data uh, starts um, starts dominating in terms of um, what recommendations are made by the algorithm. The aim of uh, of the machine learning model is to maximize uh, clicks by the user who visits at any given point in time. Of course, you know we're comparing the human to uh, to the algorithm, and the, here we have a well-specified objective function for the algorithm. For the editors, it's it's of course less clear. It's you know it's hard to get at it. Um, what we do know from the literature and from this particular setting is that the editors definitely do care about clicks and trying to get as many clicks as possible to to sort of get a sense of um, of what the editors do. The the line in blue is is the share of all, all articles by topic. Um, 
that are produced overall. The red lines are the share of articles from that particular topic or from that particular category um, or that particular broad category, which, which make their way onto the home page. So you can see that there is a reasonable amount of variation in terms of what goes on to the home page. And the green shows the overall share of page views. And what we can show in this setting is, you know, at least correlationally, there's uh, high levels of correlation between uh, clicks and what makes it on to the front page. Of course, that's not causal, but you know, that's again, half a step in trying to get a sense of whether editors care about clicks at all or not. Um, okay, so let me move on to the empirical strategy and please feel free to, to stop me and ask any, any, any sort of question that you might have. Um, so the baseline specification is uh, we're trying to explain click of user I in session S. So a session is defined as a 30 minute uh, interval. Um, basic, well, uh, it's defined as, as an interval when an individual logs on and if there's 30 minutes of inactivity, uh, then that, that session ends. So the unit of observation is the user session. We look at clicks of user I in session S and whether the individual was treated in session, uh, in session S. Due to this randomization, what we can do is we can use within a user variation with a user, you know, uh, accounting for user fixed effects, as well as uh, a time dimension, a time dummy to capture uh, general trends in, in the news cycle. This is just a randomization check to, to, say, uh, to say that, you know, on average, the randomization happened okay. This is based on individuals who we saw both during the experiment as well as before the experiment. So these are pre uh, pre experiment characteristics. And we find that, you know, in terms of the number of days that they were active, uh, you know, clicks during the day, total clicks, clicks from Germany or outside, um, you know, they seem to be balanced uh, on average. Uh, so, you know, this is the first order sanity check. Um, okay. So in terms of the baseline result, three columns here. Uh, in the first column, accounting for time fixed effects and individual fixed effects, what we find is that clicks on slot four increase by, uh, by about 3.75% uh, when the user is in the treatment group relative to when in the control, uh, relative to the control group. But of course, in, in the way that I motivated the question, you know, the, the average effects are, you know, le less interesting than uh, the heterogeneity that it might capture based on the amount of data that it has. And so we, we try and see how the treatment effect varies based on the number of observations or the number of times that individual has logged on to the website. And what we can see is that if the individual had no prior browsing history, and hence the algorithm was recommending something based on, um, based on social data or news or current news trends, we find that the editor seems to be able to predict those preferences much better. But as the algorithm keeps on getting more and more information on the individual, the individual starts clicking more when in the treatment group. So the, the, the sort of case that we're building is for better, a better match in terms of uh, taste, uh, which is identified by the algorithm. And when we look at, you know, we see the same pattern when we look at the total number of clicks you know, when there's limited data, um, then when you're, and you're in the treatment group, the, uh, the treatment doesn't perform as well. But as I get more and more data on you as the algorithm, um, then the algorithm starts uh, performing better relative to the human. Of course, this is also super parametric. You know, we can, what, what we do next is try and trace this out as much as possible. 
And what you can see here is that again, you know, in the first few visits, which would be, you know, uh, let's say uh, eight to 10, in the first eight to 10 clicks, um, the human seems to be beating the algorithm. Then the algorithm, you know, is learning and it's improving over time. But, um, and you know, statistically, these, these points are different just because of sample size, but economically, it's not that much of a difference, or at least, you know, um, depending on your prior, uh, it's not super high. Um, but what, what, what one can say is that, you know, uh, initially the human, uh, the human seems to be doing better. Then the algorithm catches up, diminishing returns sort of set in, but even for someone who, who's been, who's come onto the website about a hundred times, um, and this is, you know, at the 90th percentile, the, the algorithm outperforms the editor by about 15% here, which is, you know, which is, you know, depending on how you read the estimates, uh, reasonably high. Um, so this is, you know, trying to show that yes, personalization works, social data doesn't work uh, potentially as well relative to the human, Personalization works, but diminishing returns set in, you know, reasonably quickly. There are some gains, uh, but, you know, maybe not as large as uh, one would expect. But we want to dig into this sort of personalization story a bit more. Um, basically, our idea is that an individual who keeps coming back on, uh, provides more and more data uh, to the algorithm. Sorry, Adania, one question. Uh, yeah. Will you provide us data on whether or not people can come back to the site more often or not when there has been personalization? Because so another, we... measure, another measure of uh, how well the thing works is whether or not people find the site more useful and whether or not uh, they, uh, they have got more right. recent visits. So, I mean, maybe one way of interpreting uh, interpreting this would be to, like total number of clicks is probably correlated with the, uh, with the number of return visits, but I, I, we haven't looked at that. Uh, but I, I, would, I would think that it's highly correlated with the total number of clicks. Well, that, um, that's not obvious. I mean, you know, people say that, uh, I mean, Assume that a page shows you real junk, but you know you can't prevent yourself from checking, you know the ten fast, uh, fattest men in the world or the twenty more ridiculous uh, wedding dresses or whatever. You might, when you are on the page, you might click on this, but you might decide I'm not coming back. So, uh, you know, right? Okay. So, it's yeah. something to do with uh, this discussion of whether you've got addictive uh, uh, addiction, you know, to websites and so on. So. Right. So yeah. So I agree. I, I think I think we can we can we can run that. If my memory serves well, we did run that at some point, but I don't uh, quite remember. Uh, the the only slight issue would be that the algorithm was explicitly trained to maximize clicks of the user. So, but we can see if there are spillovers onto that other uh, correlated dimension for sure, and that would potentially be a more longer term outcome as well. Okay, so again, think, thinking about clicks um, and preferences, uh, preference heterogeneity amongst the users, um, we create a based on users who we also see in the pre-treatment period, we use um, a measure of sort of how far the user is in reading behavior relative to the others using a pre-treatment uh, cosine distance measure. Um, and for this, if you look at columns one and two, what you find is that on average, the further away you are from, uh, from the average guy, the worse the treatment uh, effect is. But as I get more and more information on you, as the algorithm, then I can cater to your preferences more. And hence, if you have 
sort of misleading behavior, I need more and more data to try and cater to your preferences. Similarly, um, we look at rank effect and match quality. Again, the idea behind the algorithm is that, you know, you potentially click uh, click on slot number four because it's picked by the algorithm. And this is an article that you might not have seen if the algorithm had not pulled it up from down below. Of course, we can only see um, what the algorithm does in the treatment group. So this, the variation that we see here is only based on when the users are in the treatment group. And what you can see is that higher the rank, so further, uh, further down the page the article is, the less likely the article is going to be clicked. But as I get more and more information on you, then I'm more uh, then I'm more likely to recommend an article which is a better fit with your taste and hence uh, has a higher probability of being clicked. So this is sort of one part of the paper where we're trying to pin down how um, the algorithm works relative to the human editor in terms of social data versus personal data. The the other dimension is that of the time dimension, the stock versus the flow. The news is, of course, you know, uh, a fast paced sort of industry. You potentially need uh, a lot more, um, you know, a continuous flow of data to update the algorithm to keep up with what the users might want. Until now, I haven't said too much about uh, about the time dimension here, right? So there's like people come back, you know, there are 100 visits, 200 visits, etc. Um, to get at the time dimension, we use uh, another, uh, another source of variation, which is uh, what we call the New Year bump. What had happened was that um, when, when the algorithm was being, being launched uh, in December of 2017, what the data science team unfortunately did was that they hard coded the year to 2017. So when it became 1st of January 2018, the model was not updated to fetch personalized data. And they, they didn't realize that there was this glitch till the 6th of January, because they were, I think they were basically away on, away on holiday and they didn't really check what was happening. So what we're going to use is this, um, this sort of data bug as a natural experiment within our experiment, keeping in mind that say on the 1st of January, when users are treated, the data is still sort of fresh, you know, from the 31st of December, uh, but data gets more and more outdated as you go along uh, that particular week before the bug is detected. And here what we find is that, again, focusing on uh, only January, uh, only December, January, and February, uh, is that um, on average, again, the treatment effect is positive, but during those particular days uh, of the new year bug, the treatment didn't do as well. And it did increasingly worse as you went along. So, you know, the new year uh, day trend or the bug day trend is, you know, uh, one for January 1st, two for January 2nd and so on. And you can see that, you know, it, it kept doing worse and worse. So, you know, this sort of gives you an idea that uh, while, you know, you can cater to preferences, you need this continuous flow of data, even if you're, you know, this large, uh, large sort of new bug. But one, one question is, okay, fine, continuous flow of data seems to matter uh, within this setting. But can, can the stock of existing data actually have uh, like a mitigating effect on this, uh, on this sort of lack of continuous flow? That is, if, if as an algorithm, I've seen you uh, quite a bit before, maybe I need to update my model less because you know, I have a fair sense of, uh, of your reading preferences, at least within that short period of time. 
Um, so what we do is that we, again, use this new year bug period and interact it with the prior stock of visits. So this is uh, on the 31st of December and prior to that. Um, and we, again, find that, um, and this is solely the new year, new year bug period. So this is uh, those, uh, those six or seven days. Uh, on average, the, the treatment effect was negative, but this is, um, you know, this is sort of mitigated by an existing stock of, uh, of data that the algorithm has access to. Um, right, so again, you know, continuous updates matter, but an existing stock of preferences can actually uh, mitigate that to some extent. So that's that's the second type of data that we've uh, that we've looked at in this uh, in this setting, which is continuous flow of data and the stock existing stock of preferences. So this sort of rounds up the first part of the paper, which is trying to trying to pin down the value of data. And now in the remaining few minutes, I'll just quickly go through what happens to consumption uh, news pack, uh, uh, news consumption patterns. Uh, and what we what we do is that we con uh, we construct um, an HHI index for consumption shares of of a particular user across different topics, and we try and see what happens um, what happens to consumption diversity when you're in the treatment group relative to when you're in the control. And what you find is that um, since most of the effect in our case is coming from personalization, when you're in the treatment group, your consumption diversity does decline. So and a higher user, uh, uh, a higher level of HHI means a reduction in consumption diversity. And this spills over a little bit to other slots, but not too much. I mean, you know, it's an order of magnitude lower. What happens, uh, what happens when, you know, when I, when I, when I, as the algorithm, see you over and over again, it's, you can see that the, the, the consumption diversity keeps on reducing over time. And this is sort of in line with our, our returns to, uh, returns to, per, uh, returns to data picture where the algorithm consistently beats, um, you know, beats the human at let's say you know four to six percent, like you know after the initial burnout rate. And so, if you keep click, you know, if you keep getting served uh, by the algorithm, um, and you know you have a higher probability of clicking on the treatment, which is personalized to your taste, you do see uh, these sort of uh, dynamics kick in. I have other results related to you know uh, other user characteristics which might explain um, why an individual interacts more with the treatment relative to control and uh, you know this this is more descriptive um, but I can I can talk about it uh, but I think I'm sort of running out of time so I also want to sort of go back to how I started out you know. A general sense of where we are in terms of the value of data and related to Turtle Shark's question to some extent. Um, so, as, as I've mentioned before, you know, we contribute to this to this literature on uh, on scale effects in uh, in data. For example, uh, this paper by Leslie Chu and Catherine Tucker, they use uh, they use a natural experiment in Yahoo Search to find that actually, if you reduce user histories. Uh, uh, or access to user histories from like six months to three months, it doesn't change too much uh, in terms of the search precision. Um, Bayri et al. They find some diminishing returns, sort of in line with uh, in line with our setting. Um, Schaefer et al. They they find some they find some uh, effect uh, in terms of uh, the value of data, and they try and you know I think there's a new version out which I'm you know. Uh, not sure what exactly the mechanism that they highlight, but again, it, it's like you know, here the contribution is that we we are able to sort of pin down and bring these together within uh, a field experiment, 
in particular, if you think of the data curve, maybe it can reconcile some of these conflicting results. That is, when you know when you have limited data, uh, then additional data for the algorithm or search engine might play a big role, but diminishing returns might kick in, uh, you know, reasonably quickly. Of course, you know, this is one context, but the the idea uh, might actually generalize. Um, moreover, this paper is related to the computer science literature, which has evaluated the effects of recommender systems. And this, uh, the computer science literature has the same sort of issue, um, like with this uh, scale effects of data literature, which is that they look at uh, offline evaluation. So they have, uh, they have a data set um, and then they, you know, they have a training sample, then they have the holdout and they, then they try and see uh, how, uh, how the algorithm does uh, in, you know, in the, uh, in the holdout sample. And, but the computer science literature is more and more like, in, you know, embracing these real time randomized experiments. And what they do find is that these offline evaluations are often at odds with randomized experiments. That is, you know, it, they, the results often flip for some reason or the other. So they are also trending in that direction. And in the computer science literature, you know, they don't focus really on the economic value. Uh, you know, they're looking at different features and their measures are slightly different. We can actually try and transform these click, uh, click based measures into, uh, uh, into rev overall revenue measures for, uh, for the, for the news outlet. And finally, um, in terms of the, the result on how algorithmic recommendations reduce consumption diversity, what this is related to, you know, a bunch of papers by Dokyun Lee and Kartik Hosanagar. But what we do here is that we have 20 weeks instead of, you know, the standard week or two weeks, so we can look at dynamics. And Actually, our result is almost the opposite because they, they look at collaborative filtering, which, which is social data, and find that individual consumption diversity actually increases. And what we show is that actually personalization is the key which leads to reduction in consumption diversity. So those are the three broad strands of literature, um, and that's all I have. You know, try to outline the, the, the value of different types of data within you know, this field experiment. Uh, we find that it's personalization, which plays a big role, at least not in our, you know, in our case, social recommendations don't play uh, as big a role. Um, continuous flow of data is required, but it's mitigated by an existing stock of preferences. And finally, algorithmic recommendations due to personalization are reducing consumption diversity and this uh, increases over time and that's all that thank you so much thank you so much anaya so uh now it's the q and a period so feel free to uh, uh unmute yourself and ask questions yeah. oh uh paul go ahead um, yes thank you anaya I, I enjoyed that very much can you uh, i'd like to push you a bit on uh, the meaning of your measures of uh, consumption diversity? Because I could imagine two very different stories. Think of consumption diversity in a different um, dimension, uh, say in the kind of food you eat. Now, um, you might look at somebody who eats uh, Indian food tonight and Mexican food tomorrow night and Italian food uh, on, on uh, Thursday and uh, um, Turkish food on Friday as somebody who really enjoys diversity. Or you could look at them as somebody who's desperately flailing around to try and find out what they like. And um, if it's the former, then recommendation systems ought to be able to uh, figure out that they like diversity and adapt their recommendations to offer them a reasonable variety in the recommendations. If it's the latter, then the whole role of the recommendation system is to find out that they really like Turkish food, get them to that equilibrium and keep them there. Okay, now what I, it, it seems to me your measures are not really able to distinguish between those two stories. You don't know whether the 
um, reduction in diversity you see as a result of the recommendations is um, the fact that um, basically the algorithm is better at guessing the type of topics you want to look at. Um, and maybe there are other dimensions in which those the actual treatment of those topics is quite diverse or whether what's going on is that the, um, the recommendations are somehow or other narrowing the uh, choice available to the uh, consumer, perhaps because of sort of behavioral reasons, they're lazy, they just do what they're recommended, um, in, in a way that um, in some sense betrays their genuine underlying preferences for a, a diversity in the forms of their consumption. And I wonder if you could think about how you might be able to use your data to distinguish between those two stories. Uh, yeah, so from the outset, again, you know, this is one algorithm, the, the particular algorithm is, you know, uh, sort of trained to to identify your preferences and try and cater to that and personal data kicks in uh, kicks in as soon as you know uh, you know as soon as it sees enough number of visits um, I, I'm, I'm you know again I have I haven't thought too much about trying to distinguish these but maybe I'm thinking whether we can use our measures of uh, you know, uh, cosine distance that I, uh, in terms of user uh, like heterogeneity in user preferences and try and see how uh, that interacts, like, you know, how, how the trends in consumption diversity might be different for people who are relatively mainstream going in relative to those who, uh, who are reasonably diverse starting out. So people who we observed before the experiment as well as during the experiment. Maybe that's one way of, of getting at it. I'm, uh, I'm just hypothesizing right now, but maybe, maybe that's something that we could look at. Since we're looking at that in the value of data section anyway, we can definitely operationalize it here. And that might be a good Any sorry. other thoughts, questions? Yeah, uh, sorry, maybe if I missed something while you were uh, speaking, Anandia, but did you speak about uh, whether or not the total number of clicks uh, change and what we have a substitution with, with other clicks? Uh, yeah, so, uh, so in general, we find the same sort of trend uh, with total number of clicks, that is when there's limited data, uh, then overall clicks go down, but you know, as I, you know, as you go, go on with better algorithmic recommendations, the total number of clicks within a particular session increases. So what we do find is a little bit of business stealing from, from other slots and the overall, the, the, the impact on overall click on average is, you know, is maybe slightly negative, but not, you know, less than half a percent. So it almost seems to be a, a, a pure business stealing effect. We don't, we don't really dwell on that too much because again, you know, because of the specificity of the experiment, you know, if, if someone is to adopt algorithms, you're potentially going to maybe, maybe do it for the whole website. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, we do see some, some business stealing uh, based on our estimates. And do you, did you try to, uh, uh, to use the fact that for some people the the, the switch was between the fifth and the fourth uh, slot and for others from the 20th to the fourth slot and whether or not this made a difference in the, uh, uh, you know the consequences I mean it seems that for some people uh, what your algorithm did was basically change the order very little some you know the uh, the new story who says in fifth place became in fourth place. Um, right. For others, it was the new story yes. which was in the uh, 60th place. Uh, does that make any difference? Or, uh, yeah, so, so we have, if you can still see my screen, right? Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, so, one second. If you look at this one, so this is, this is looking at the rank effect. 
And this is again, you know, this is sort of correlational because we see variation only within treatment. So on, on average, as you go lower down the page, you're less likely to click in general. But as I get more information on you, and I, then the algorithm can pull it up from further down, then you're more likely to click. And this is for, you know, including slots. Uh, this is starting at slot five onwards here. And this is starting at, uh, sort of slot 14. So, you know, like 10, you know, 10 positions down and you can see that, you know, the effect becomes stronger. So in some sense, by looking at what happens at the beginning, you would have a measure of how different is the taste of the individual from the taste of the editors. If you looked at the, um, uh, what happens at the beginning for the first visits, uh, right. you would, you, in some sense, you, you can measure whether or not the individuals have a very different taste than the editor and what is the effect, you know, what does this make for the, uh, how people react to the ranking and so on. To, to the, All right, to the right. So maybe what you're alluding to is sort of merging like this, our measure of cosine distance, which is basically uh, using information on on people who, who we observed before the experiment and how far they were uh, in terms of you know their diversity of consumption and then maybe interacting that with the rank effects yeah, i'm not entirely sure but um... uh, because basically what you're trying to say is that the rank effects would also be affected by how how diverse you were initially versus not right yeah and how different you were from the editors in from terms of editor. taste yeah from the editors uh, right so this is the the measure of cosine distance is trying to capture how far the user is relative to relative to other users and you're saying that uh, the benchmark should be the editors. We could do that actually. We could do that because we have we have data on what the control group looked like day after day, hour after hour. So we can construct that measure. Yeah, and then we can interact it with uh, these rank effects. Cool. Yeah. So, Anaya, you no, I, I have a question. Um, I was curious whether the algorithm is, you know, you said it's maximizing clicks. Is it doing that in a myopic way, or is it? Is there some role for exploration that is, you know, maximizing clicks not just today for this user, but in present discounted sense? Yeah. So it's. From from what we know of the algorithm and based on the paper that they uh, that uh, that they use as the baseline algorithm, uh, you try and maximize clicks for when the user logs on. So I think it's reasonably myopic in that sense. Right, and because if it if it had a sort of a longer term or had an exploration aspect to it, then you know some of the implications would be different in terms of you know people getting stuck in filter bubble and so on. True, true. So I agree. And, you know, m until now, as far as I know, most algorithms try and just, you know, maximize clicks, try and, you know, identify your preferences. And, uh, but more and more in this literature, people are trying to see how algorithm, uh, algorithms or recommended systems can be devised such that there is room for exploration. There are some papers coming out with that. But yeah, in this case, it's maximizing uh, clicks myopically. That's, yeah. Right. And, and this is sort of also related to, I think, uh, Jacques' question about, you know, do people come back more often, which is a potentially longer term uh, measure, but yeah. Yeah. And you sort of mentioned like personal data information filtering and then social data collaborative filtering as being two aspects depending on whether, you know, how much history the user had. Um, 
Is there any way to sort of understand how the two interact? You know, like, I, I would yeah, imagine uh, like, there's, a, there's sort of an interaction effect that, you know, the more, the more social data that actually helps you learn faster in terms of the personal data. Yeah, so potentially, so if we, if we look at this sort of picture, you know, it's, it's generally, you know, generally diminishing returns kicking in and, you know, this initially there's only social data and then there's, you know, personal data uh, being fed into the model. Um, what we know from the algorithm is that as, as more and more personal data comes, uh, uh, comes within the algorithm's reach, then it gets a higher weight in the recommendation. Uh, can we completely separate the two? Not, not necessarily. And that's why I, I focus a bit more on, you know, when there is no social, uh, when there's no personal data, that's like the cleanest, uh, that, uh, that's the cleanest situation for, you know, identifying how the how social data is doing relative to the human editor and you know maybe let's say the 50th visit or the 100th visit is you know these sort of two extremes can i you know help us identify the role of personal versus social there might be some interaction in this middle uh, in this middle uh, uh, in, in the middle here which we can't separate out so that's why even in the paper we try and you know um, we try and make this reasonably clear. Thank you. So speaking of a diminishing return, like you mentioned that uh, past studies also kind of discovered a diminishing return in their data sets. Like, have we seen any papers, like uh, maybe this is also for the audience, have we seen any papers with a non-diminishing return data effect, like in the sense that, uh, I mean, it, it might be a constant return or increased return. I'm trying to figure out like, a, like, a, were we ever seeing like a, a scenario with a, like, right. a, yeah, a different situation, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, and this is, you know, like related to the broader conversation about the value of data. Um, so, you know, Catherine Tucker and Leslie Chu's paper, they don't find any effect. They just use a natural experiment. So they don't, uh, they, they find none effects. Uh, the binary paper finds some level of diminishing returns. And here we have, you know, reasonably clear diminishing returns. Um, I think, I think part of the issue is the, in the general conversation is that, you know, what if Facebook uses data from a variety of sources? So, you know, uses, uh, you know, uses WhatsApp data, uses, uh, you know, maybe it has, you know, so, some fitness app uh, that it might promote at some point, uh, you know, uses running behavior, uses, you know, data from Facebook wallet, um, and puts all of that together for an individual or, you know, a bunch of similar individuals, then there is some sense that uh, increasing returns might kick in at some point. Uh, but I have not, you know, it's hard, you know, like it's hard to get access to that sort of data to actually understand. Uh, but I think that's the biggest worry when we think about, you know, regula regulating big data. But I haven't seen too many papers which try and, uh, which are able to highlight that. Thank you very much. So any more questions? Not a question, but I would just uh, um, comment on your question, oh. which is uh, you know, there are some examples where you, you know, some applications where you will get increasing, you would expect to get increasing returns, like autonomous vehicles, right? Like you're going to get almost nothing in terms of value from the data until you get to a very high level. And then once you reach some threshold where now it's actually useful, then you get a massive increase in return. So by the nature of the, the problem that they're trying to solve, you know, you think about the returns to data, it's like you need enormous amount of data to get anywhere, but at some point it'll, you know, be a huge, it'll be a huge increase. And then maybe after that, it's diminishing again. So I, I would think, I would think an S shaped curve could be quite natural for, for quite a lot of different applications. 
But do you, do you do you know of any any paper which is able to, because I like in my in how I see the literature I don't see any paper. No, which I don't is think this is uh, because we don't have the data on we don't have the data on autonomous yet, right? Because we haven't reached that point. But um, this is more like from the from the theory of it, or at least from the you know people working right. on it, right? Rather than an empirical paper. Right. But, but uh, a great example. Why don't, why don't we uh, stop right now because it's been an hour and I would like to stop the recording. Uh, just to say uh, thank you very much for everybody who's participated and because we are French, we are giving you uh, August off. So, uh, but we are uh, looking forward to restarting the, the seminars on, uh, uh, in September. Uh, Julian and uh, Andre have cooked have made a very great program. Thank you to both of them, actually, for the great work they've done. And uh, thank you, Ananya. And, you know, we're keeping the session open. So if you uh, want to uh, insult uh, Ananya when it's not recorded, you can do it as soon as I uh, pause the recording. Bye-bye. Uh, thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.